So here we are. Ready for another webinar, Joanna. Are you ready? Yes, I am always ready, Giuseppe. And we have on board Daniela Cucurullo. Yeah, fantastic. And oh, I can see everyone. the numbers coming in. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome. Slowly, slowly, please enter and share with us. Where yes. are you from? Yeah, where they're from today. And also, if possible, the, your school. Is it a high school? Is it a technical school, a liceo? We'd like to know more about you. So please share in the chat as you're coming in. And I again say welcome to, to everyone. Benvenuti a tutti. I'm not <laughs> going to do the other language like when we do no. the international <laughs> events. So to keep that to, to Italian and English. Okay, buon pomeriggio. Welcome to everyone. So they're all coming in. I can see them coming. Wet afternoon. Yes, Stefano. It's wet where I am in Ancona. Last Very night. good. Yes. Primary school, uh, Donatella. Primary school, that's good, Donatella. The new generation, you're working on them. <laughs> I always say, those are the people that are going to be paying my pension, so make sure they're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome, Sardinia. Sardinia. Where, where about, where yeah, about Sardinia? Yeah. In Sardinia? Turin, Turin. Hi. And mm -hmm. Rubigo, tell us also about what school you do, you're teaching. And how many students, for example? The last time we found out quite interesting numbers. Yeah. Lecce, hi, hi, Rovigo, Lecce, Cremona. We're having a mix, uh, Daniela, as you can see. Sicily. There's a wait in Sicily as well today. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's been raining over there, uh, Joanna, Pisa. Um, no, it's actually okay. Well, I've actually been in the house most of the day, just every so <laughs> much. So am I, so. But it's actually it's raining here sad. in our corner. <laughs> Good afternoon, Casal Monferrato, Rieti, Antonella, welcome. D Daniela, is it raining there in Naples? No, no, it's not it's cloudy, but not raining. Somehow that part of Italy is always seems to be slightly <laughs> better. It must be the Apennine Mountains that are making a difference there. Yeah. Institute Technical, 100 students, <laughs> like it's big work. That's Technical school, no, thank you. And it's good you had time to come to the webinar as well. <laughs> Sorry, Joanna, can you repeat that? I said, with 100 students, she also has time to come to the webinar. That's great. It's a miracle. <laughs> Universita uh, Van Vitelli, welcome. Yes, I'm actually informed. I was looking at the numbers earlier. We have Universita Van Vitelli, so welcome to Universita Van Vitelli. And also Universita Cattolica has registered in Politecnico di Bari, Universita di Firenze, e-campus and uh, Universita Basilicata. So we're really, really pleased to have you with us this afternoon. A lot of liché, Treviso. Welcome everybody, benvenuti. Just to, just a few seconds, sorry, to, to welcome everybody. We'll be starting. So Foggia, hi, hi Stefania. Liché, Scienze Applicate, Monferrato, Classico. I see quite a few liché actually, that's really good. Because today, Joanna will be focusing on B1, if I remember. So it's yes, I am indeed. the right target. Yes. Hello, Franco Rossi. That's a classic, <laughs> isn't it? <that>? Franco Rossi. <laughs> Hi, Franco. Upper Seppin School from Benevento, Scuola Berghiero. And interesting, interesting also, the Scuola Berghieri. They definitely need support with, uh, with the, you know, the languages. They're always asking for you know, support material. Franco Novate Nova Milanese, so up in Lombardia. That's quite a lot. <laughs> University di Florence, welcome. That's good. Ber San Pellegrino Termet Bergamo. I need to go there. I've never been. Sounds like a lovely place. So welcome on board, everybody. In the meantime, while you're writing, I will be starting this webinar. And it is a real pleasure for me to moderate this uh, this webinar. It in and it is without a doubt, the very first webinar that we're doing together with TESOL Italy, and I'm delighted for that. We've been working since, uh, I think it was November when we started thinking about the idea with, um, with TESOL Italy, and here we are. So welcome to this first webinar. I am Giuseppe Romagnoli. I'm the brand ambassador here for Language Cert in Italy. I'm based in Ancona, as I said before, uh, and um, at the moment, I'm not teaching all those big numbers of students, so I'm a lucky, <laughs> lucky position at the moment, but we are so grateful for having new teachers coming in and participating in this interesting webinar. Um, this webinar is our first one, as I said, and it's a collaboration with TESOL Italy 
And today the talk is about strategies for the development of language skills in preparation for international ESOL certifications. And obviously as representative of Language Cert, I am really, really proud to say that we at Language Cert really are focused on trying to build a network together with uh, the community, teachers, organizations such as TESOL. So thank you so much, Daniela, for this opportunity. We are really, really honored and um, I'll be introducing you in a second. The objective of this webinar is to give teachers some practical tips. And this is where Joanna will be uh, the speaker on how to prepare students for the English certification exams B1 um, with methodology that enhances intrinsic motivation, but also using digital solutions. And for that, Joanna, you're very good at that. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Welcome to you all. I know that we also have people that have registered from out of Italy, Argentina, USA, Spain, Ukraine, Greece, and um, and obviously the vast majority, as you could see in the chat from all over Italy. So we're really, really delighted. A um, little bit of housekeeping, the chat is open and Joanna has always been pro, uh, proactive in that sense. So please feel free to engage as we go on. Um, this is also a place if you want to write a question for the question and answer session, but at the end, don't worry, you can also add them at the end. Um, just to let you know, stay with us right to the end, because right at the end, after the question and answer session, there will be um, a little survey, 20 seconds, not more, very important for us from Language Cert and also TESOL to understand where we can improve and how to make things uh, better for you. Um, so let me allow me to introduce you to Daniela Cocorulo. I don't think I need to introduce you because President of TESOL, Italy. Daniela, would you like to say something? Oh, hello. Yes. Hello, everyone. And thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Giuseppe and Joanna, for organizing this webinar together. This is the first of a long series, I think. Uh, just a few words to say for non-members of TISOL Italy what TISOL Italy is. Uh, TISOL Italy is a grassroots organization run by teachers and for teachers. It was founded in 1975 by Mary Finocchiaro and Renzo Titone and other experts, uh, um, teaching experts and pioneers in language teaching. So almost 50 years ago. Uh, just a few words, we are, in, uh, we are affiliates of TESOL International uh, based in Virginia and uh, uh, Apple based in UK. Uh, our mission is to develop the expertise of those involved in teaching English to speakers of other languages, as TESOL says, and uh, to force uh, professional growth and active participation in language teaching. So based on this mission, we are very pleased to be here together uh, because this is a webinar jointly organized by Language Search and uh, TESOL Italy. And uh, we, we thank you for um, participating uh, today and uh, for following us in the future. Thank you so much, Daniela. It's a real pleasure for us uh, to collaborate. And I'm sure, as you said, our brains will get together and organize more webinars. So teachers do give us your feedback because that's where we start working on the next webinars. Now, uh, let me allow me also to say thank you to the people that we don't see here. You can see a lot of language search windows, but there's a lot of people at the back end from TESOL also that have helped us work on this uh, webinar. So I want to thank Anna from the events team, Raffaella from marketing, Christina, Alexia, Marianna, Paola Giuliani, our business development manager here in Italy. And of course, all the team, because I'm not going to be able to mention them all. And I want to thank TESOL for the 100% support, Elizabeth Evans, and Daniela in first person that you've always been available and answering also WhatsApp messages. So thank you so much. Um, now, basta, as I say, let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> basta, my basta. turn, my turn. <laughs> it's about you now, Joanna, it's about you. Um, I just saw in the chat, so welcome US. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So Joanna, who is Joanna Paulinelli? Well, Joanna Paulinelli is the managing director of the British School uh, in Pisa and a teacher trainer, and of course, a teacher, an experienced teacher. Joanna has a, a master's in psychological research methods and a master's in educational psychology and is a licensed tutor of the Italian Association of Dyslexia. I'm not going to read the whole bio because Joanna said to me, don't, but yeah. trust me, it is full, full of experience. Uh, so Joanna, without further ado, up to you now. The ball oh, is yours. You. Enjoy, you. enjoy everyone. We'll see you later. 
Thank you, Giuseppe, and thank you to everyone joining today and Language Share and TISA. So we're going to get right in now. So today we are going to be looking at the B1 Achiever um, exam. Now, uh, I do like the word achiever because I feel that studying and preparing for this exam really does increase students' abilities to achieve good communication skills. But I also think that working on exam material and making students familiar with the exam does motivate them because not only do they know, uh, have they got a clear objective, but also many of the tasks involved in these exams use authentic language. So it is motivating for them. And also today I will be showing you how you can flip some of the tasks so you can, from a speaking task, can become a listening task and vice versa. And I'll be showing you some engaging activities to use with your students. So before we start, as, as Giuseppe said, I like to make it interactive. So I want to ask you, how many of you have actually prepared students for language search exams? And maybe what levels have you, have you prepared in the past? So if you can write on the chat box, I'd like to get to know you a little bit. I'd like to get to know my audience. So today we're talking about B1, but obviously many of the tips um, actually work for all levels. Okay, Marilena, A2, B1. Okay, excellent, excellent, A1, A2, super. Super, so you've already prepared for some before. Excellent, okay. All right then, Angela, B1, B2, excellent. All right, so I will be talking about, giving you tips as Giuseppe said. I'll start off with the spoken exam and then I'll move on to the written exam. And I also, I'll be showing you some preparation material. Okay, also C2, Franco Rossi, excellent. All right, thank you for uh, writing in the chat box. It always makes, it's good to, I've got, I know that I've got people uh, there because obviously in a webinar, I can't see you. So if you can write to me, um, it makes it more engaging. All right, so let's start with the speaking. Now, the language search speaking exam is 12 minutes. Now, um, it involves part one, which are some short questions. Part two are role plays. Now I find this extremely interesting part of the exam and I'll go into this in more detail, um, role play tasks. Then there's a two-way discussion where um, the interlocutor has got to reach an agreement with the, with the candidate. And there's also a monologue with follow-up questions. So four parts. All right, now the first part is um, about um, students are asked questions uh, on different topics. Now, what topics do you think candidates are asked about in this part of the exam? Any, any ideas? I'm sure you do, because I've seen a lot of you have prepared for exams. So let's think of some exam topics. Bon pomeriggio, Donata. Any, any ideas? Okay, holidays, Marilena, absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. Hobbies, yes. Okay, free time. Eh, wonderful, absolutely. Everyday activities, yes. Okay, so I'm going to show where you live. Oh, 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 yes, Franco, absolutely where you live. All right, so these are just some typical examples like watching films, languages, health and fitness, okay? Expectations, Stefano, I like that. Yes, expectations. All right, so just very, you know, B1 level. So what was the last film you watched? Okay, so this type of, um, these type of questions. Now, I think to make a little bit more interactive, I would like to show you bits of the video, of bits of the exam, so you can understand the situation. As you can see by the language exam, there is one candidate with the interlocutor, okay? I'll just show you a little bit of this video, and then we can talk about uh, ideas to prepare for this part. Language Search International Spoken ESOL Exam Achiever Level, and this is the 1st of July 2019, and Sharokish exam begins. Hello, my name is Christina Kurti. Can you spell your family name for me, please? Of course, K-I-S. Thank you. Now, which country are you from? Hungary. Thank you. Uh, now, part one, I'm going to ask you some questions about yourself and your ideas, all right? All right. The first topic is watching films. Um, are there any kinds of films you don't? Okay, so I just wanted to show you that. Show you that. Now, let's. I want you to think about 
some of the difficulties that students might come up against in this part one of the exam. So they walk into the room, they have the interlocutor in front of them and they're asked questions. What difficulties might students have at this point? So let's think of the exam situation. All right, any ideas? You know, I mean, it depends the familiarity of the, fam yes, anxiety, emotional environment. Yes, absolutely, Stefano. Okay, excellent. Yes, anxiety. Yeah, shyness. Okay, the different accent. Yes, you know, um, I obviously, I'm from Scotland. So when I, I when I do do exams, I always, I make myself, <laughs> I slow down a bit uh, for these levels. Stress. Okay, they are not into the topic. Yeah. Okay, now, these are excellent, excellent, yeah. Balancing between the urge to give a long answer or just answer the question. Yes, absolutely, understanding. Okay, sorry, I've moved on. Now, let's think about ways that we can help them, okay? So the anxiety part, um, you know, the more that you prepare them and give them, you know, um, show them what the exam is all about, then, you know, that the anxiety, or obviously, you know, if, if they don't know what they're up against, they're going to be more anxious, okay? But if you've prepared them well, they know that the first questions, the first part's going to be questions on topics, you know, they feel more confident, okay? So this is important. But also, yes, it's important for you to really have gone in to the topics um, during when you prepare the students. But very, two very short tips I'm going to give you now. I say to my students, because very often, you know, the anxiety can increase if they're asked a question which is irrelevant to them. You know? So, for example, what type of films do you enjoy watching? You know, if the student doesn't really watch films, they can say, well, Actually, you know, I don't watch, hardly ever watch films. I prefer watching TV shows, okay? So um, tell them that they can flip the question, all right? So uh, someone said before that if it's not interesting to them, if they're not into the topic, they can flip the question, okay? That was it, that Raquel, yes. Also, another small tip, playing for time. So sometimes students, they do get a little bit, you know, they can they actually with the anxiety can actually get them their brains to sort of like, you know, cloud over. And sometimes just teaching them things like, OK, yes, um, let me think about that. or Oh, that's an interesting question. Then this can help them play for time. Yes. All right. Now. I'm going to just give you two little uh, tips you can that can really help them help them uh, with the topics. So the first one um, I'm going to just share with you is an activity that I do now that you can do the digital form or the just the normal um, non-digital form. So you ask your students to make up questions on various topics, okay? In non-digital, you can put them in a box and they can ask each other questions or using one of the quiz um, sites, for example, I like using Word, Word Wall. I find it very easy to use. And this is like a spin the wheel. OK, so they get used to speaking about the topics and and all the vocabulary around the topic. And to make it a little bit more motivational for them, um, I say to them, OK, let's choose a, a famous person. OK, so they have to get into the character of the famous person. And then um, the other student actually interviews um, the famous person asking about these um, interests and you know, all the topics um, in, in part one. So this, you know, there's a nice way sometimes when students actually go into uh, another role and take on the role of someone else, they find it actually less, um, they have less anxiety. So this is another little tip I'd like to give you. All right. So um, now um, I have to bring this up today because over the last month, um, artificial intelligence has exploded. Okay, you probably know this. Has anyone tried out any any uh, artificial intelligence um, websites or apps with their students yet? Anyone? Uh, well, I have been. Um, I have been looking at many different websites, and I found this. I want to share this one with you. Um, it's called. I uh, hear. Hold on a second. Yes, the chat GPT April, yes, but unfortunately, um, Italy, Italy has banned chat GPT, hopefully, uh, it said six months, but we'll see. However, there are many other um, chats available. Um, but anyway, I found this one, and this is called 
Talk Pal, and this is a good way to practice part one. It's a self-study with artificial intelligence. So you can just ask the, you can either um, record your voice or just write in the message. And you ask them and about a topic, and and you talk about a topic, and the and the and the artificial intelligence answers you. So this is uh, something that I've just discovered. I'm doing lots of research on this because I'm going to be doing a webinar next week on artificial intelligence. But I wanted to add this in. All right, now the second part of this exam is role playing everyday situations. Now I find this really interesting because. This part really works on authentic language. And I find that it motivates the students. It takes them out of their comfort zone, okay? I must say, but the more that they practice it and the more that they do it, I can see big improvements in their communication um, skills. So I'm going to sh just play a little bit of this video for you. Just like Did you order then? Third situation, we are at a science museum. I start. We have got about an hour. What shall we look at first? Mm, maybe we can see uh, that picture over there. Oh, okay. The, you mean that picture of that big horse? Yeah, I love horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. You used to play Pony Friends, right? Okay, so in this part of the test, um, as I said, they're giving a little role play situation, and either the examiner starts or the student or the candidate starts. Now, think about what could be difficult in this part of the. I mean, if students aren't prepared, what could be difficult, uh, especially for teenagers, um, in this part of the test where they've got to actually they have a little role play to do. Any any ideas? I don't know if anyone's tried this role play task with their students. Maybe you can tell me, unexpected organization of ideas. Absolutely, Angela, Marilena. Yes, yes. I mean, um, if they're not used to doing it and they have to actually invent how they feel, um, sometimes it's more difficult for students. I mean, it's a very creative way to use English and maybe they're not used to doing this in school, all right? Um, you know, and I think it's um, I think it's it's interesting, and I do see that the more students do this, then the more that they actually enjoy it. And um, I say to them, okay, you're going to become little actors, you know, and they have to. We're going to have fun, and I say, put on your acting hat. Um, so, and we go, we you know, we we work on the language, and um, obviously a lot of brainstorming, picking the right vocabulary, absolutely. And helping them to organize their ideas is, is very important. All right. Um, so, for example, when we say brainstorming and vocabulary, we think about ways to start the role play. Because very often um, it's difficult uh, for students to actually start the, the role play. So just things like, you know, um, think, oh, it's, things a way to, to start, excuse me, or, or replying, yes, that's really nice, or I love it just giving them the vocabulary that, that they need. Um, sometimes I say to my students, okay, so why don't you take, so for example, it could be a, a role play about a neighbor. And I say, well, why don't you become a grumpy neighbor or an angry neighbor? And that way they, they can practice different types of intonation and, and they really enjoy that as well. Now, one of the, um, I really do enjoy this part because for me, theater and drama and music are all fantastic uh, ways to teach English. And I really do believe that they, they increase intrinsic motivation that, you know, that um, wanting to learn. And um, I'm involved in different um, projects with Erasmus. And one of the favorite projects that I, that I have done, um, actually, um, it's related to this. And I wanted to share it with you because, um, I do a lot of remote theater. Okay, so you're probably thinking, what is remote theater? Um, well, I started off working with a hands up project in Gaza, uh, where our students used to do um, theater for children in Gaza and vice versa. But we started doing this and we, our, I could see the students really enjoyed it. And we created this project, which is actually called um, a remote theater project, and it's it's free. And I wanted to share this with you because if you like to use theater, and um, 
it's actually free and you can you can just download um, all the plays that, that we've created. There's plays um, according to CFR level um, on, on really nice topics. And a lot of the topics are related to exams. Uh, there, are, there are plays on the environment and things like that. And it's a really good way um, for students to practice their English. And it helps them when they are in role place um, situations like in this part of the exam, because again, it is authentic language. All right, so let's move on from there to part three. Now, in part three, they have to dis usually discuss something with the interlocutor, okay? And, um, and they actually have a, a, a task sheet that they have to look at. I'm going to show you a little bit of part three as well so you can understand what it's about. So uh, I think we should definitely include some pictures of modern ways of communication. What do you think about that? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, I think the first picture can be a computer uh, mm -hmm. with Okay, so here they're talking about um, different technical, uh, uh, um, in, um, new technology. But what's important here in this task is that they have to learn how to suggest, how to agree, how to disagree, right? Now, very often in, in Italy, um, it's difficult for students to initiate, to ask questions. This language of asking questions is quite particular to English, okay, and um, and I and also I always say to them when you're reaching agreement, don't just say yes to the interlocutor. You know, um, you know, you can actually use um, language where you disagree and you give your own ideas. So basically, give them as much um, language as you can, which allows them to be able to um, discuss things in English. For example, um, language like why don't we and how about, I think we should, what do you think about? This language is quite difficult for Italians. Um, they're not used to using this language. So I would you know, work on this um, and also give them different ways of um, disagreeing, even politely. You know, we, we do like to be polite in our, when, the, when we disagree. So, mm, well, I prefer, or why don't we? Okay, so if you give them this language, they will find this part much easier. And also, again, this is authentic communicative language. I can't stress this enough, okay? Now, part four, they have to speak about a, a topic. Now, this is another to this is a task that has to be practiced. I'm just going to show you a little bit at the beginning and then we can discuss it. Okay, you now have 30 seconds to write some notes to help you. Okay, so here they're given a topic and they actually have time to prepare. Now, 30 seconds is not a lot, but if they know they've got 30 seconds, maybe they can do a, a quick concept map. That's That would really help them, okay? So your topic is your favorite holiday place. Okay, then they're given the topic and then they have to talk about it. Okay, this is the, this task now. And um, what do you think now, what do you think is the main difficulty of this task? Okay, talking for two minutes on a, a, on a, on a subject. Okay, what do you think is, is quite difficult about this? I mean, some students are good at this. I don't know, have you ever tried to do this in English. Because I always say to, to teachers that I train, try and do the tasks. Yeah, vocabulary, Mauro, absolutely, okay? Being able to time the answer, yes, yes, the topic may be sensitive. Well, actually, yes, you're right. I have found myself in situations where the topic is sensitive, yeah? Um, but the time with seeing all essential points, focus on the topic, absolutely, again, the more that you prepare your students for this, the better they are. And also it's good and it's a good task for them to do. You know, they really can improve their, their, their communicative abilities. I say to them, record yourself. OK, so I, I'm going to give this to you after the webinar when you've got some free time. You know, try and do this task and record yourself. Listen back to yourself. This, you know, this can help you understand the difficulties that they may have and how to help them to structure what they've got to say. Verb tense is Mauro, absolutely yes. Uh huh. And um, and also after the, the after they do this, they have these follow up questions. And again, you know, they can flip the questions. 
And I always say to them, you know, try and give a long answer when you, after you've done your, you've, you've, you've talked for two minutes and then they ask you a question, try and make it long because the longer that you, the, uh, the longer that they answer, then the less questions they will ask you that could maybe throw you or, or get you anxious. All right, now, the nice thing about these um, language set exams that the, there is a booklet on the website, I'll show you afterwards, where you can see all the topics from the spoken um, exam and you can work with this. Now, what I do with my students is we take each topic because I work with a lot with dyslexic students. We create concept maps for every topic and vocabulary um, sch um, schemas on every topic so they know exactly um, the vocabulary and a concept map which actually helps them to as to um, keep their ideas organized okay so you know I, I can't I really always this is these are inclusive strategies for all students to use and another little game that I do because you know it's important uh, for them to understand how long two minutes is okay so this is called just a minute but I say just two minute game and you can do this either with a, a digital using maybe Mentimeter, you get them to write down the different topics they'd like to speak about and the topic that comes up the biggest, you start, you start with that. Or maybe um, you write the topics on the blackboard and they, they, they can maybe get a, a paper ball and throw, throw the paper ball onto the blackboard and that's a topic that they start with. And you put them into groups and um, they start, the, one of them times the student and the student starts to, to, do, to talk and then if they stop before the two minutes another student can finish it off and that student gets the point so this is a, a nice um, engaging activity which really does help them prepare for this part of the exam all right another idea um, these the videos that I've shown you are available on YouTube okay so um, what I do is I give them the criteria um, of what's of the mark scheme, what the examiners are looking for, what that's been tested on. And I put them into groups. So I say, for example, one group has to focus on um, coherence. One group has to, has to concentrate on grammar. And I put them into groups and they watch the video and they have to they have to listen to the students' mistakes if they're doing grammar and, um, and then give their feedback, give them a mark. And this is really interesting because some things, some of the mistakes that they make, I can ask the students, well, how would you see that better? And this is like a cooperative learning. We all know as teachers that cooperative learning is, um, is a good motivational tool for all types of learning. Um, another uh, area of uh, intrinsic motivation that I use a lot um, is actually project-based learning. And I use some of the topics, for example, um, the environment. And we maybe do a little project over two or three weeks where we do a, uh, where we, where we, where we put them into groups and they have to create this project on one of the exam topics. Um, this, for example, was a project on carbon footprint. And, um, and I just want to show you what the students came up with at the end of the project. I'll just show you a little bit of the video when we leave a room because it will be a waste of energy. We can um, use the stairs instead of the elevator. Um, we can avoid drinking. Okay, so basically at the end of the project, they had to uh, they had to do a, they had to do a presentation on how to reduce their carbon footprint. And again, they're working on an exam topic. They're working together and project-based learning um, works on a lot of 21st century skills. All right, so these um, are just some ideas. Um, and also um, a nice thing about when you do a project work is um, working on the metacognitive skills in the sense that, you know, after they've done the project, ask the students about the project. So the most important part, what they could have done differently, what they have learned, these things can also help students, um, not only with their English, but in general, uh, make them become better learners. Another, um, I'm going to, I'm trying to give you some engaging activities, you know, so taking the exam topics, okay, these are things that I have done in the classroom. I like to do a lot of web quests, and someone before said one of the topics is talking about interests. 
And I do find that students, when they talk about their hobbies and things that they love, it really does increase in engagement. And uh, this is a web quest activity we did. So we, we chose a favorite singer, okay? And um, which at the time was Ed Sheeran, but this was a few years ago. And uh, one of the groups actually did a web quest where they had to, where they had some questions and they had to put the questions into Google, for example, how old, and they have to write, is Ed Sheeran? Okay, because if not, it's not going to understand. Um, they have to put it, and then, then they created a web quest. I think they used, um, yeah, there's a presentation there. And the other students uh, asked, asked Alexa. So they, instead of writing into Google, they asked Alexa. And this was a few years ago. Obviously, now we also have artificial intelligence to ask, but I'm just going to show you a little bit of the video. Alexa was born to stop. Alexa, how old is Ed Sheeran? Ed Sheeran is 28 years old. He was born on the 17th of February 1991. Okay, sorry, I'm going to have to stop that because my Alexa has, has answered me. <laughs> I went ahead, so I'm not going to say that word. But anyway, this was like a web quiz where we asked, uh, I, um, I'm not going to say the word, some questions. Another idea is um, I did a web quest after we did superlatives to make it a bit more interesting. We did a web quest on the Guinness Book of Records. So they had to ask Google uh, who is, for example, the tallest man in the world, where is he from? And they had to create a little world records, Guinness Book of Records presentation. So just some activities. Um, I, I, we don't have a lot of time today. But again, using um, exam topics, using grammar to make um, to, to make to, to make the, the preparing for the exam a bit more interesting. Now, let's look at some tips for the written part of the exam. So the listening is 30 minutes. And um, I'm just gonna, now I'm going to just go through little bits of the exam so you can understand and give you some tips um, also for this part. Now, the first part, what I find interesting about this, the language set listening exam, um, is that there are, in this, there are conversations, again, authentic conversations. Um, so for example, here you have some sentences and you have to choose the best reply. So the better that you've worked on the speaking part and the, uh, you know doing the role plays and things, the easier this will be. Um, now what I do is I, I like to work on deductive learning. And so I will ask them to create a conversation for each answer, okay? So um, for example, it isn't this evening. So for example, are you going to Julia's party tonight? Oh, it isn't this evening or so, something like that, okay? So you can get them, your students, to create a conversation for each answer. And then you can actually get them to act out the listening parts as well, which becomes a speaking task. So that's what I was talking about when I said flipping the, 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 the tasks. Here in part two, again, there are three short conversations, okay? And you have to choose the appropriate answer, okay? Um, so I'm, and so these, to make this a bit more interesting, um, I give them the transcripts, right? And then again, they have to act out the conversations. But I might say to them, well, why don't you make one of the one of the one of the speakers angry or excited so that they can actually, you know, get into character and they can use their intonation. OK, so as I said, these tasks are very similar in um, speaking and listening. All right. So let's move on to number three. Now, this is an interesting task because they listen to a recording. Right. And they have to jot down some answers, just one or two to three words. Now, when it comes to listening tasks, I always say to my students, underline the keywords and the questions. Um, in general, I do this um, for listening, for reading. I always get them to read the questions first. And it's very important to work on keywords because many students, you know, when you tell them to underline keywords, they tend to to just, you know, underline everything. So work on keywords. And also recently I did this task where I said to them, okay, let's think of a topic that you enjoy. And I got them to create a listening to a podcast where they were actually, they, they recorded themselves and then they created this task for the other students. 
And um, so they actually created this specific task using a topic that they enjoyed. And they found this really interesting. So, you know, like you can use the, this preparation material, you can be creative and, and, uh, and make interesting tasks for your students. Now, part four, here it's a long discussion, okay? And again, I like to get students to maybe create to create the questions, you know, I always, maybe I give them the listening task and then I say, okay, you create the questions. Okay, this is all ways to increase their um, um, 21st century skills and just it just motivates them. All right, so let's just move on to the reading and writing. I think it's important for me to show you the parts of the exam, okay, just to get you thinking about things that you can do as well. Um, all right, so the first one is, they have got takes and it's just a fill in the gap task. Okay, this is on part one, okay? And the second one here is, this is like the, you know, the distractor task. They've got to fill in the gap and they've got one distractor. And if students are not used to this task, you know, please uh, let them do it, you know, make sure that they realize that it is a distractor. And um, because if not, when they, when they go to the exam, they, they get distracted by the distractor. And, in part three, there are, this is like a classic task where there are different texts and then uh, they have to choose, um, they have to choose the, the, the correct text for the question. Now, there's something that I would like to share with you, what I do with my students. Um, I've told you before that I underline the keywords in the questions, okay? But very often, because I said I work with a lot of dyslexic students in a, an inclusive manner, we do post-it um, maps. You see, what's a post-it map? Well, basically, uh, for each paragraph, or in this in this situation, for each text, they would write down the keywords on the post-it. Okay, then they stick the post-it onto the text. Okay, so in this case, it would be four. So then, when they're actually answering the questions, they don't have to read the text again. They have the keywords, and this really helps but it helps even more um with longer text for example in this one there is a long text okay so and this once they've got all their post-its on they don't need the text and they get used to um, writing the keywords and it, they become much quicker in doing these reading tasks i think it's an inclusive tool that helps all students i don't know if anyone's you've done this before but i I train my students from primary school to on to look at the questions, underline the keywords, go into the text, and and do this post-it map. And then another um, activity that you can do with a long test like this, the one if it's on a topic that's quite interesting, in the next lesson they can perhaps even create a short presentation on that topic. Again, it's become a speaking task and also a writing task if they have to write up the presentation, okay? Now, back to artificial intelligence. I know I've put it in again um, because I do think that it has sort of shaken up things um, since over the last month. And I, I would want to share this uh, with you. This is a site called Al Gore. I don't know if anyone has tried it before. So basically you can put a long text, just like the one I've shown you, or this is a text that I um, just took from the internet on Monet. And um, you can scan the text on your phone as well. And then you say to it, create a concept map. Okay, you ready? Da, 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 da. And this is what it does. It takes the, the, a text and it breaks it up into the main concepts. So for example, the early life of Monet, his artistic development is broken up the task, the, the, the text. And then it's got all the key part, parts of the text. Now, the, the images you put in afterwards, they don't come up straight away. But this is another good way to help students understand reading comprehensions and all reading comprehensions. And also if you click on, there's another button where you can click on and it actually gives you even more information that perhaps wasn't in the text. So um, I'll go, it's, it's free. And not actually it's free to, to use two, um, two or three times and then you can pay like a year subscription, but it's not, it's not expensive. All right, so um, just some more general tips for the written part, okay? And just in tips in general. So I've told you about the keywords. 
Um, but very often in both the listening and the reading, um, they have to decide what um, um, what they agree on. So, for example, you know, especially in the conversation things, so look out for ones like, yes, you're right, absolutely. And also, I always say to my students, you know, you have to, you're not going to find the exact word, you know, if you've, if you've underlined the keyword in the question, you're not going to find the, the exact word in the text or the listening, you're going to, going to find a word that's similar. So we work on these a lot. And um, sometimes it actually is the exact word. And they say to me, uh, Prof, but there is the exact word. And I say, well, not very often. It's always a word that sounds like the word. And um, it's like the word, but it's not the exact word. <laughs> <laughs> all right um and i in all of these exams there are always tricks okay and we as teachers have got to, uh, to teach them the many tricks and um and i say to them don't just pick the option especially in the listening that you've heard you know there's always going to be a trick you know so you get them and they can actually i always say to them you know, tell me what is the trick what was put there to confuse you you know i so i like to talk to my students and yeah um yeah um, okay, and also I say to them, if you if you're not sure about the answer, you know, um, look at all the options. Exclude the ones which you are a hundred percent sure are not correct, and then the one that you think is correct. Think about why it's correct. You know, get them to think about it and justify. And this is an interesting activity that you can do with your students in groups where you give them the, the sample material and they have to justify why they think, uh, why they have chosen the answer in groups. And this is a, it's a, it's also become the speaking activity also. Now, um, uh, I'm going to just show you that the, the writing, there's two writing parts for the B1. The first one, they have to, in this one here, they have to write a response to a letter or a poster, okay, and it's between 70 and 100 words. And the other one is a more informal letter to a friend, okay, on a given topic, for example, invite a friend to stay. And again, if they are good with the language of suggesting and discussion from the speaking, this is e easier for them, you know, shall I, why don't we meet, things like that, okay. So the, all these skills are all intertwined and the activities are, you know, they all, you can flip them just as I've been saying. Now, um, some general tips for the reading, for the writing. Sometimes um, when they get to the exam, as, as we've said, they get very anxious. So I always say, read the question carefully. Um, if you're asked to put in three points, make sure you include all three, because very often they don't. Um, and then sometimes, but not always, the third point is a personal idea, okay. Now, um, I want to say the, uh, the importance of planning the writing, okay? So I, because we do a lot of work with concept maps and organization, my students are used to, you know, doing a map to organize their thoughts before they start the, the letter. And they've got time to do this in the exam. If, you, if they've practiced it, they know how long they've got, they'll be fine. And in class, you know, do a lot of brainstorming and also, for example, if you have to write about a holiday, we say, okay, so what tenses are we going to use? We're going to use the future tenses. If you're describing your day, we're going to use the present tense and adverbs of frequency and get them thinking about the language. Okay, that I can't stress this enough. Uh, another tip I'd like to, to just point out is the style and register is extremely important because you know, the part one is more formal, part two is informal. If it's informal, they don't, they can use contractions. If it's formal, they don't use contractions. Some of these things, because students, maybe you tell your students this, but unless they practice, um, you know, on exam day, they can forget these, these things. And then, you know, give them the uh, ways to open up emails and closing letters. Oh, you know, the more vocabulary that you give them, they practice, the easier it is for them. And the last thing is rereading. Now, if you if you allow your students to practice the exam, they know how long they have got, and they know the importance of rereading before they 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 finish. Because very often, just by rereading things, they can see their mistakes. 
And I like my students to reread them, but in their mind. So obviously they can't speak the language, but in their mind, if they actually could hear their voice in their head, very often they can actually hear the mistakes, okay? So it's important for them to eliminate repetition and say to them, upgrade your vocabulary, you know, instead of big, use enormous, things like that. Now, um, this is something that I have created um, for all levels, even from primary, as a primary teachers uh, here. So um, I've been talking a lot about underlining keywords and because obviously it helps memory. So you as teachers, you know, if you're underlining the mistakes or highlighting mistakes, very often this is actually, you know, it's not very uh, productive because they can actually remember the mistakes. And uh, it's difficult to understand how to, how to help students uh, correct their writing without demotivating them. So I created um, a correction code uh, with each of my classes, okay? So it's all different for each class where, um, where we, we choose little codes for things that, 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 that they've done wrong in the, in the writing. For example, if there's missing a preposition or V for the verb. So we have this correction code. And when I mark their writing, very often I ask them to leave a line between each um, sentence. I will put in the code and they know what they've done. And then they can actually correct these things themselves and it helps them reflect and self-correction we know is a very good metacognitive skill. Um, and yes, back to artificial intelligence. Uh, there are many sites now that correct. Now, if you use things like ChatGPT and you ask it to correct the English, it will completely transform the writing. And we don't want that, okay? But if you give, if you use things like Instatex, this is an example, it will show you ways where you can correct it and it can show you maybe better ways to use the language, all right? And this is and this is good even at the for the higher levels also. And uh, um, Genie is, a view, and there's many other things like JAT-GPT, but this is called Genie. And I did ask it to write, a, I gave, gave an exam task, and this is what it came up with in like a second. And um, so what I would do with this as a teacher is that, you know, it can be used as a template, okay? And then this, you can actually analyze the language in it. They can use it to structure their writing. Has anyone used, has anyone, tried uh, this um, with their students. I mean, uh, when, when you show students this, they're like, oh, you know, they get all excited because they think they can actually use it um, for their, you know, they can just use it. But obviously it's important to tell them that these type of things are tools. And, um, and then I always say to them, don't worry, I can tell if you've used ChatGPT, <laughs> I tell them, so, yeah. But anyway, it's a good way, um, I think, to be used as a tool in the classroom. And for example, um, I, I did a writing the other, the other day and my students, they, they, they were getting the present perfect wrong. And you can actually, you know, you can ask ChatGPT or one of these sites to um, create tasks. For example, this, I asked it to create some fill in the gap tasks in the present perfect. Um, we're using the present perfect. Okay, this is a, one idea. So your students can actually create their own exercises for things that they're having difficulty with. And Write Sonic is actually what I'm using at the moment instead of ChatGPT. Uh, and I asked it here to create different types of exercises in the present perfect. And it gave me some types of exercises that um, you as a teacher could create. And what I did was I gave this to the students and I said, okay, here are some examples of, of exercises. Use these examples and create your own exercises, okay? That's so, for example, um, creating a multiple choice or here, you know, um, error correction. I asked them to, to write an error, um, a sentence. And then what they did was they then gave this these questions to the other students. So they mixed the questions that they have done. So this is just some ways to use this new form of technology that I think is a, it's quite, um, I think it's going to make a big impact in our, in our teaching lives. Um, and back to project work, you know, another way to help with writing is to get them to, to create newspapers or blogs. This is Book Creator, 
where the students actually created their own book, um, audio book, which is actually a really nice app and it's free to use with your students. I do like to use some digital technology and put it in the webinars. Um, my favorite way to practice uh, writing is also lyrics training. I don't know if anyone's used, I bet you have, I bet you've used lyrics training. Have, have you used lyrics training before? Are you still there, everybody? <laughs> no, yes. Well, I love, yes, no. Anna, you have, yes. Yes, I have. Yes, yes, we are here. Thank you, Stefano. Because, you know, it's not, I can't see you, so I'm um, not yet well. I find it fascinating because even though all this technology over the years, this it still seems to be one of the most motivational tools to use in the classroom. So basically, you choose a song or you get your students to choose a song and then you choose the level. All right, so we'll maybe go with intermediate. And you can either choose uh, the right mode where they have to put, they, they listen to the song and then it stops at a point. Okay, so for example, here, and then and this was Ed Sheeran, we're back to Ed Sheeran. So it stopped at I found and have to write found. Or there's actually a multiple choice task they can do. And sometimes I start with multiple choice and then we go on to the right mode, okay? And, and if they don't understand, if they, they go back and they can listen again by clicking this button, okay? Um, now, what I usually do is they, if they haven't understood, okay, but then, and I've got to help them, and then, and then if they don't understand, I tell them the word before they click on the answer or before they write the answer, I say, go back, listen, and tell me if you can now hear the word, okay? And this way they're working a lot on their listening and obviously their reading and their writing skills. So it's like a multitask, okay? And then if you want to create a speaking, they can actually talk about the video, talk about the song, okay? So if you've got, if, you, if your students are tired in the last 10 minutes of the lesson, I really do suggest working with the athletics training. And the last thing I'm going to show you, because I know I'm going on a bit. Um, now, uh, you may think that you can't do this with B1 students, but I have done it with A2 students, okay? It's working with lyrics and lyrics writing, okay? So what I do is, um, I, I've, I've been doing this uh, over the last few years, actually, because I do think that it increases many things, uh, apart from vocabulary and motivation, but also it works on the phonological awareness that even if students are not dyslexic, you know, English is a very difficult language because it's not transparent. So we choose a song. So, for example, we chose Volare. Um, you all know the song Volare, yes? Um, so Volare, we, we talked about what's the main theme of Volare. And one of the words that they wanted to include in the song was blue because we we're putting the song into English, okay? So we went on the internet and this is a website that gave us all the words that rang with blue, okay? And this is how, because obviously, you know, you've got to have words that, you know, that rhyme for the song and it's good for them to do this as well. And we created a uh, Volari in English. Now, I'm not going to show you my, my teens because they don't want to be videoed. So I'm showing you a higher level, okay? I didn't want, I <laughs> and I'm just gonna let you see what we came up with, okay? Okay, so basically, I mean, this is music, you know, I mean, I think because um, because I love music, you know, I do find it easier to do these things, but um, I think, so I mean, a lot of students like music, but it's nice to bring in your passions into the classroom, you know, and you probably think, well, you know, how can I if I have to prepare them for exams, but I think I've showed you today that you can, you know, bring in your, pa if you like art or whatever passion you have, 
it sort of rubs off on the students. The students like um, to hear about your passions and also talk about their passions. So, um, and you can incorporate all these things in, into exam preparation. So you're probably um, thinking, okay, so what materials are you using, Joanna? Well, basically, um, Language Set has got all the preparation material on the website. And um, if you go, this is like for the, the written part, but there's also for the speaking part. In the speaking part, you can see the booklet that I was talking about with the with the topics. Okay, it's very structured and the booklet helps you to understand also. And and yes, and I think um I think I have reached the end and I've managed to do it all in the time, you know, I maybe did it a bit fast, but you know, there's a video. You, you can go back and you can relook at things, okay? Um, but the basic thing that I want to share with you is that working on exams can be motivational. That's my main, that's my take home message for today. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Thank you so much. I think everyone can agree that it's very inspiring and you've given a lot and lots of great tips and tools, uh, especially the mm -hmm. final part. And it seemed to be very engaging. I can see people already say thank you. So thank you once again, uh, Joanne. I, I, you know, we were just a month ago in Didacta. We were talking about, you know, humanizing technology in language learning. I think there's this component that always comes back as technology develops, yeah. uh, that the human touch, when you say passion, the teacher has the passion. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think there's yeah, a lot. So that, artificial that. intelligence doesn't have that passion. However, <laughs> exactly. it can help as it teaches because it is it's not a human brain. You know, it doesn't get tired, so it can help us as teachers who do get tired. To do <laughs> it can help us. You know, it really can. It's, it's a tool. It's a tool, but obviously it does not have the passion. You never know though in the future. <laughs> I think the approach of you, you the being curious to try the tools yeah. is also what you're doing. And as you said, chat DTP is like stopped it for whatever, for whatever reason in Italy, but you're finding other tools to, oh, to yes, help your students. Oh, yes, of course. There's many so other. question and answer session is officially open. We don't want to take too much of your time, but this is your moment. So please Thank you, everybody. feel free yeah, to. Inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> uh, OK, yeah. so. <laughs> One of the, the questions about the registration, yes, just to let you all know, we you'll be receiving a certificate, because someone else mentioned that, um, a follow-up email with a certificate and the link to the recording. So you won't be getting the slides, but you actually get Joanna live. So I think it's much more interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, Joanna, I mean, I've just got a couple of messages sent to me privately. Um, one you already mentioned towards the end about the preparation material. So the language search website, um, any other tips that you can recommend the preparation material? We know that- well, uh, I mean, I mean, as a, it depends. I mean, I do like to use the actual, I mean, I, this might seem really strange to you, but I do like to use, um, if I'm prepared the, the material and then work around it with all different other things, you know, as a teacher, but it depends you know, what, how you work as a teacher, you know. Very often we don't have a lot of time to prepare students. So if we get straight down into the preparation material, sometimes it helps. It just depends how long you've got to prepare your students, you know. I can see a question over here from Stefania in Foggia. The materials basically, as Joanna showed you, the ones that she showed you is on the website. You can find all the practice papers. You can actually find a lot of webinars also that Language Cert organized for you know, preparing the different parts of the exams. Um, we know that some publishers also have prepared some material, so you'll yes. find that on the website too. We've just had a couple of months ago, one with Macmillan uh, Language Hub. We remember that one, Joanna. Yeah, if you've got more time, you know, obviously the Language Hub books are good because they've been mapped for language there. Yeah, to pay. So yeah. Just There's also a booklet from ELI. I remember that supports yes. students to prepare for the, the exams. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Thank you, language is helping us. <laughs> Very good. Thank <laughs> you. There's always people at the back end helping us. Very good. Um, <laughs> Sean, um, one of the questions, uh, Joanna, is uh, students with special needs. This is another area because I mentioned in your bio you you specialize in dyslexia. Can you just a couple of words on that also? Well, um, well, I mean, it, it depends what age group. Obviously, you know, I mean, my 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 students with them. Um, a lot of my students with dyslexia are, are when they get to the to the B1, they're actually um you know 17, 18. And I always tell them to do the 
the digital online exam because obviously that you know they're at home they use their own computer it's easier for them and um, language yeah, gives them more time and if they've got specific requests and um, but yeah I mean I'm you know students with dyslexia of course they can pass this the exam they just you just got to focus very much on helping them to prepare absolutely and give them the vocabulary that they need um as important so yeah yeah but thank yes, you Joanna We'll definitely bring this topic into the next academic yeah. year too. We want to talk about that. Um, language search put some more links over there. Thank you so much. It's great to work in a team like this. Um, <laughs> um, one teacher has asked me, how can we offer the exam at, in our school? Well, that's not no problem whatsoever. You can contact us. We have on our website um, all our partners all over Italy. So find your local partner and you can um, contact them or contact us directly. And we're more than happy to help you on that. Then um, as for the certificate, again, we'll be, you'll be getting your certificate in the email. I don't really have other questions. It seems to be, Joanna, since we started doing these webinars, it's less and less questions. People are more and more. And everyone's still here. <laughs> anyone's still, still here. here. So, and I, you want I, me to sing I, a song? Is that why you're roommate? You I, want I, me to I think sing a just song? everyone, would you like Joanna at this point to sing a song? <laughs> you know, we could, let's do it. Yes, of course, <laughs> Marilena. Marilena I, I knew you would say you want to. Come on. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> this is a, we've never done this, so please. Joanna, are you ready? Oh, no. Stop singing we'll, keep song. we'll keep the song for the next web. That way I know you're going to come. There you go. There you oh, go. so you're, you're basically saying that as you come to the next web and I'll be singing a song. Okay. Well, you're going to be singing that Bolaris <laughs> song in English. <laughs> yes, it's really good, actually. And they're so creative, you know, the way they, they, they did it all themselves. I mean, I helped them, but they did it themselves, you know. Sometimes we underestimate the abilities of our students to be creative, you know. So there you go. I like yeah. this idea of singing Volari with you, <laughs> with everybody there to go. To All right. Them. Okay. I've said it now. Yes. And it's recorded as well. <laughs> and it's recorded. So everybody, language search, uh, Tissel Italy, remember that she's promised. Be, next, we are next. all here. So they're actually waiting for you to sing. <laughs> <laughs> but just, just to share, before we start the webinar, just before we can share this, Joanna, there's, there is a moment that we like a little bit tense and, you know, we, we have a few little singies and sing yeah, we, do, we do, we do. But music is music is, is such a good tool to use in the classroom, you know. Uh, even definitely. like young teenagers, you know. I've even done made up like rap songs with them in English as well, you know. <laughs> I think you should um, you know, share that could be a next webinar. You don't want me to record them, Giuseppe. You know, I, I know, I know. Exist, can I, you know? But you um, can do it. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, I think everyone's like probably laughing at this end of the webinar uh, situation. I just want to remind you that you will be getting this uh, email with the link. So you'll hear this final part too. You will have at the end when you close, you'll get a pop up uh, um, for the survey. Please do take just 20 seconds. Uh, it is really important for our professional development and for our community that we're trying to build here in Italy and all over, obviously. So please do stay with us. Uh, Daniela, I don't know if you're connected, if you'd like to just turn on your webcam and say goodbye to her. Music allows learning language. Yes, that's right. Uh, that is absolutely true. Yeah, that's the uh, thing. We've got to remove the stress and anxiety that, you know. So, Zephyr, can you see me? Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, I, we kind you. of can see you, but we can definitely Hello. hear you. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. A very inspiring webinar, and uh, it was a great success. So it can be the first step <laughs> of joining Leap in the future. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.